Hello, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Today, it is all things Casemate. Uh, spotlighting, again, one of my favorite military history publishers with a ton of new releases, books that are already out, uh, freshly out, brand new. Um, and uh, as you can see, Daisy in the background is ready for this um, this book haul of new releases uh, from Casemate and their various imprints. So without further ado, because we have a lot of books to get through, let's get to them. The first is the lovely coffee table book. Um, I was so excited to get a look at, and uh, I have looked through this already. Um, the text is very minimal, so uh, but just a beautiful coffee table book with wonderful artwork. Uh, this is the Royal Navy in Action, Art from Dreadnought to Vengeance by John Fairley. A uh, slim little volume. It's from the Pen and Sword uh, Maritime imprint. Slim volume. But this is all about the artwork um, of the British Royal Navy in the eight, 19th and 20th centuries. Um, this fine book brings together a collection of superb artworks which bear witness to the majesty of these mighty ships in action and at the same time are are a memorial to the dangers, heroism, and victories at sea. Uh, the reader is treated to a feast of the finest maritime paintings depicting the Royal Navy's dramatic confrontations of the last 120 years. Um, fabulous. Masters such as Norman Wilkinson, Richard Urich, or Urich, and William Wiley cover the two world wars. Other works illustrate the crucial role of the Navy in the Falklands War and the latest aircraft carriers are also represented. Oh, the one on the right here, Survivors of the Lusitania. That is um, artwork by is it William Wiley. Look at the look at the artwork. Beautiful. This is a lovely coffee table book. If your interest lies in all things nautical, maritime, uh, Navy, naval history, military history. Again, just mostly it's it's just a collection of artwork. We've got some some uh, narrative running throughout, just very very brief. But um, oh, it's a beautiful book. I really enjoyed this book. So um, it's just a joy just to kind of look at it, look at all these these dark, these amazing paintings. So the Royal Navy in action. A little bit of for the art lover there. Okay. Sorry about that. I've got so many that they're they're on the floor. Now, after I make this video, they will be shelved. All right, so this one I'm really excited about. Um, I was listening to a history podcast the other day, and they mentioned this guy. And I was like, I don't know much about him, but I think I just got a casemate book on him, and I'm really excited. This is Rodolfo Graziani, Story of an Italian General by Alessandro Cova, translated by James Citrullo. It's put out by Font Hill Books. Another, uh, there's another image of the, uh, the general there. So let's learn about Graziani. Rodolfo Graziani, Marshal of Italy, Viceroy of uh, Ethiopia, and one of Mussolini's most valued generals, remains to this day a divisive figure in his homeland. Revered by some Italians as a patriot and vilified by others as a murderer, his reputation abroad endures as one of infamy. To the people of Libya, he is the man who hanged Omar al-Mukhtar. In Ethiopia, the one behind the poison gas bombings. To the British, he is the buffoon-like Italian general whose troops surrendered en masse. But what is the true story of Rodolfo Graziani? This rigorously researched biography draws on private letters and secret communications to reveal a fascinating portrait of fascist Italy's most notorious military leader. What emerges is a man of glaring contradictions, a doting family man and a violent soldier. Graziani was a key figure of Italy's momentous 1930s, enjoying widespread popularity during the height of Mussolini's dictatorship. His exploits in Libya and Ethiopia capture the public's imagination. After his death, he was largely forgotten, but in 2012, the mausoleum erected in his honor, uh-oh, has sparked fresh controversy. I bet 
Um, fa fabulous. I have never heard of this this man, but um, up until recently, like I said, I was listening to a history podcast, and they, they mentioned Graziani, and I was like, I got this book, and I'm going to read it, and I can't wait. Um, so thank you, Casemate, Font Hill Books. Ooh. And this one was sent to me. Um, uh, the good folks at Casemate, Daniel, thank you. You sent this to me, and uh, definitely want to feature this on my channel. This is the Soviet Army's High Commands in War and Peace, 1941 to 1992 by Richard W. Harrison. This is a Casemate book. It says here, this is the first full treatment of the unique phenomenon of high commands in the Soviet Army during World War II and the Cold War. The vast distances involved in fighting Nazi Germany in World War II forced the Soviet political military leadership to resort to new organizational expedients in order to control operations along the extended front. The solution was the high commands, each responsible for two or more fronts, also known as army groups, and along maritime axes, one or more fleets. These were short-lived on the Eastern Front, but the High Command established in the Far East in 1945 oversaw the Red Army's highly effective campaign against Japanese forces in Manchuria and would be resurrected to address rising tensions in the area. In the 1980s, new High Commands were created in Europe and South Asia, lasting until shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So this is a fresh kind of interesting take on just the military structure uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, in, the, in the guise of these uh, so-called high commands, um, and that's what they term them. Uh, you know, yeah, it says five of them here. Um, so this looks really, this looks fascinating. I, I haven't, you know, really delved into the actual changing structure uh, during the period after, um, uh, we're during World War II, the beginning of World War II, and through the end of the Soviet Union. So um, this looks fantastic. I can't wait. So that is also a new release from Casemate. Oh, and you guys know my love of memoir. We're kind of jumping all over the place, era-wise and war-wise, but um, I love soldier memoirs, and this one is looks like it's going to be great. It's going to be great. This is called The Good Captain. Personal Memoir of America at War by R.D. Hooker, Jr. Another casemate title. So what do we have here? Let me tell you. I have a pub sheet. Actually, I could have held that up. So I will hold this up. Let me see. I can't read too much on that one. R.D. Hooker, Jr. Uh, was a combat soldier and leader in five wars. He then served as a senior Pentagon advisor and, a white and as a White House staff member in four different administrations. At the time of his retirement from the military in 2010, he was the most decorated colonel in the U.S. Army. Wow. Beginning with his enlistment at 18 in 1975, this memoir chronicles his experiences in the post-Vietnam Army as a young paratrooper, as a West Point cadet, and as a combatant in the many military conflicts which followed. Hooker served in the invasion of Grenada in the earliest days of the Somali uh, sorry, of the Somalia intervention as one of the first American responders to the, sorry, I ran that together. Hooker served in the invasion of Grenada in the earliest days of the Somalia intervention as one of the first American responders to the Rwandan genocide uh, with the first American units to enter both Bosnia and Kosovo in peacekeeping operations in the Sinai Desert in the Pentagon on 9-11, and again in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Rising from private to colonel, he commanded a paratroop company, battalion, and brigade, and served in the continental U.S., Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East, uh, Africa, and South a Southwest Asia. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is going to be pretty amazing. Um, he's been everywhere. Right, okay, I did that. When not serving with troops, he taught at West Point and served in several high-level Pentagon assignments and in the White House in the administrations of George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump. Uh, as a greedy and accomplished combat soldier and leader of vast experience, the author's writing conveys a first-person, hands-on appreciation of the American soldier and of close combat around the globe and through five different conflicts in all its demanding, heroic, and often tragic dimensions. 
few, if any, memoirs of this genre, ca genre can match the narrative arc shown here. True. In addition, the author describes each of these campaigns from a strategic and policy perspective, uh, informed by his White House and Pentagon experiences, as well as years of academic training. Oh, this is going to be, whew, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to actually just kind of start reading this right now. Uh, the, juxtaposi the juxtaposition of these contrasting perspectives, perspectives is compelling and unique. Um, so I'm looking forward to this very much. I had no idea R.D. Hooker uh, was just everywhere and had everything happen to him. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a great military memoir. With the added bonus of just his, again, his academic credentials and his... Uh, work in the, in the government. It's going to be a, a nice synthesis of material. All right. Next up we have so another, this is from uh, Frontline Books, an imprint that Casemate distributes. This is Great Naval Battles of the Pacific War. And th these are the official admiralty accounts um, for Midway, Coral Sea, Java Sea, Guadalcanal, and Leyte Gulf. It's compiled by John Grayan. Nice little sturdy book here. So it says here, the key naval battles against Imperial Japan in the Pacific during the Second World War have been described many times by numerous diligent and skillful historians. Such histories are, of course, the products of many years, even decades, of accumulated knowledge, but also of a received consensus of how the war played out to its seemingly inevitable conclusion. That, of course, is not how it was perceived at the time. Hindsight, as we know, gives us 2020 vision. The accounts here, compiled for and on behalf of the Admiralty, were written either during or immediately after the end of the war, before historians had begun to give their assessment of these momentous events. These accounts were created for internal consumption, to guide and instruct naval officers. It was never intended that they would be released to the general public. As such, there was no jingoistic drum beating, no axes to grind, no new angles to try and find. The authors of these accounts relate each battle, move by move, as they unfolded accurately and dispassionately. That is so rare. This makes these accounts so invaluable. They read almost like a running commentary as action follows action, minute follows minute. The sensation is magnified by the absolute impartiality of the authors, their sole attempt being to provide a thorough but very clear and comprehensible record so that others in the future could understand precisely how each battle was fought. These accounts can never be superseded and never replaced. Written by naval officers of the time, for naval officers of the future, they are the permanent record of the great victories and the sobering defeat in the Java, S and the Java Sea during the struggle for control of the Pacific, which for many months hung precariously in the balance. Now, how valuable is this? What a resource. Um, Wow. Oh, wow. This, I mean, it just like hand drawn, like maps, you know, charts, preliminary movements. We've got some, uh, and then we've got some nice uh, supporting photog and photography and photos, archival photos in the center. Um, so, what a wonderful resource for um, just the Pacific War uh, naval conflicts uh, written dispassionately. Go figure. All right, well, we'll keep trucking here. Oh, and this one was sent to me. Um, thank you, Daniel, for sending this to me. I will indeed highlight this title. Uh, another memoir. From World, and this is from World War II. And this is from Casemate Publishers. This is Ace in a Day, the memoir of an 8th Air Force fighter pilot in World War II by Lieutenant Colonel Wayne K. Blickenstaff, edited by Graham Cross. Casemate title out right now. So Wayne K. Blickenstaff, who is this guy? I love the hair. Well, I love that wavy hair that they had, the men had back in World War II. How did they do that? It kind of like looks like it's been like s someone sat on it, you know, but it's like curly or it's wavy and then it's like pushed in. I just love that. <laughs> um, all right. Let's try to get the glare off of there. So Wayne K. Blickenstaff, known as Blick, of course, 
uh, was a stalwart of the 350th Fighter Squadron of the 353rd Fighter Group based at Gox Hill, Metfield, and Raid in England as part of the 8th Air Force prosecuting the strategic air campaign against Germany. As an original cadre member, he rose steadily through the ranks from a second lieutenant element leader to flight leader, squadron ops officer, squadron leader, and finally to a lieutenant colonel and group operations officer. Um, let me skip down here. Ace in a Day is Blick's honest and gritty personal memoir of his air war in Europe. His vivid writing places you in the cockpit as he and his comrades battle the enemy in the skies or attack ground targets across Europe. His account conveys a true sense of just how dangerous flying World War II fighters in all weather conditions really was. Um, it was not just the enemy that can kill you. A moment's inattention, overconfidence, or simple mistake could be deadly. As a keen observer of character, Blick's pen portraits of those around him, including many of those who sadly did not survive the war, offer a poignant and deeply moving tribute to those with whom he served. Um, so this just sounds like a great read. Let me make sure I didn't just hit a button there by accident. Again, I just love soldiers and airmen's memoirs. I just, I eat them up. How many of you out there enjoy a good military memoir? I know it's a very select audience when I bring out the casemate, when I bring out the military history. Um, but I know there's a lot of you out there. And I'd love to know what your, uh, your particular niche area of military history you enjoy. Um, are they battle surveys? Are they biographies of uh, military uh, commanders or soldiers? Uh, or is it memoir? You know, um, I'd be curious to know what what you guys are into. Or is it espionage? And I think we're kind of kind of hitting it with this next one. Another casemate book, brand new out, is Britain's Secret Defenses. Civilian Saboteurs, Spies, and Assassins During the Second World War by Andrew Chatterton. Forward by James Holland. Look at that. And did you know I just realized this the other day? I've got a, uh, several books by James Holland. Um, he's got a, well, I'm waiting on the third volume of his uh, World War II trilogy um, to come out. But he did recently write up two big books, one on the D-Day and then one on Sicily. Um, but he is the brother of Tom Holland who is a great favorite of mine, who, you know, has written primarily uh, ancient history, uh, Persian fire, Dominion, my most recent book, uh, History of uh, Christianity, or something like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's wit written tons of ancient history, but they're brothers, of course. Tom and James Holland did not know they were related. So, any hoods, check out this book. All right. So this book was featured in Newsweek. Get out of Dodge. Here we go. The narrative surrounding Britain's anti-invasion forces has often centered on Dad's army. That's in quotes. Like, oh, sorry. Centered on Dad's army-like character, characters running around with pitchforks on unpreparedness and sense of inevitability of invasion and defeat. The truth, however, is very different. Top secret, highly trained, and ruthless civilian volunteers were being recruited as early as the summer of 1940. Had the Germans attempted an invasion, they would have been countered by saboteurs and guerrilla fighters uh, emerging from secret bunkers and monitored by swaths of spies and observers who would have passed details on via runners, wireless operators, and ATS women in disguised bunkers. Alongside these secret forces, the Home Guard were also setting up their own guerrilla groups, and SIS, um, now known as MI6, we're setting up post-occupation groups of civilians, including teenagers, to act as sabotage cells, wireless operators, and assassins. Had the navies had the navies had the Nazis taken control of the country? Isn't that fascinating? Um, the civilians involved in these groups understood the need uh, for absolute secrecy, and their commitment to keeping quiet meant that most went to their grave without ever telling anyone of their role not even their closest family members. There has been no official and little public recognition of what these dedicated men and women were willing to do for their country in its hour of need. And after over 80 years of silence, the time has come to highlight their remarkable role. Uh, so, wow. I, I wasn't aware that the uh, on the domestic front, the, the home front, that uh, you know, Britain was already kind of ginning up a homespun 
defense among the citizenry. That's pretty cool. Uh, sorry, allergies or something is going on today. All right, next book, another case mate title, brand new, that was sent to me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I wasn't aware of this book. This is The Machine Gunner's War. From Normandy to Victory with the 1st Infantry Division in World War II by Ernest Albert Andy Andrews, Jr. With the assistance of David B. Hurt. So, A Machine Gunner's War. Um, let's see here. So this might be like another type of memoir, maybe? It's a first-hand account anyway. Um, Andy Andrews began his training as a machine gunner at Fort McClellan, Alabama, in July 1943. In early 1944, he arrived in the UK for further training before D-Day. Um, uh, Andy's company, part of the 1st Infantry Division, departed to England on the evening of June 5th on the USS Henrico. Due to a problem with his landing craft, Andy only reached Omaha Beach on the early evening of June 6th, but still had a harrowing experience. Fighting in Normandy, Andy was nicked by a bullet and evacuated to England in late July when the wound became infected before returning to participate in the Normandy breakout. Following the race across France in late August, Andy participated in the rout of several retreating German units near, bon near Mons, Belgium, and his outfit approached Aiken in mid-September. For a month, Andy's squad defended a bunker position in the Siegfried Line against repeated German attacks. Then, after Aiken surrendered, the unit fought its way through the Hurtgen Forest to take Hill 232. Early on the morning of November 19th, Andy engaged in his toughest battle of the war as the Germans attempted to retake Hill 232. Andy was wounded in the shoulder. Um, then he goes on to some more stuff here. So, um, I'm just, I've got so many more books to show, but it says this is a vivid first-hand account, taking the reader along from Normandy to victory with Andy and his machine gun crew. So another, like, first-hand account memoir, um, you know. I just, I just love it. I love hearing straight from the, the mouth of the soldiers themselves and what they saw. Ooh getting into the realm that I've been really getting into lately is some some Irish history here during uh, World War II. This is from Gill Books, but it's put out by Casemate, and this is Ireland's Secret War. Dan Bryan, G2, and the Lost Tapes that Reveal the Hunt for Ireland's Nazi Spies by Mark McMenamin. Nice little paperback, Gill Books. Um, Ireland's secret war reveals strategic Nazi intentions for Ireland and the real role of leading government figures of the time, placing Dan Bryan and G2, the military intelligence branch, the military intelligence branch of the Irish Defense Forces, at the center of the country's battle against Nazi Germany. With the help of over 35 hours of previously unpublished audio recordings that were held in storage in Northern California for over 50 years. Mark McMiniman reveals the extraordinary unheard, unheard history of World War II in Ireland, told from the point of view of the main protagonists. Um, Ireland's Secret War reassesses the legacy of the Irish contribution to the Allied war effort through the voices of those involved at the time. Um, so this is news to me. You know, I didn't know Ireland had an issue or Nazis were operating, you know, within Ireland. So... Um, I'm intrigued. I like reading new aspects of history uh, that have never been revealed to me before. So, Ireland's Secret War, out now. So I got a couple more books. I'm gonna go, hang on. All right, we're gonna stick with Irish history. This is a tiny little book put out by Mer Mercier Books. Um, but ever since I, I just recently read and reviewed The Yank about a guy who, uh, I guess he had dual citizenship, but uh, was a U.S. Marine, and then he went and fought for the um, Irish Republican Army. And uh, it's fascinating. Anyway, but this is about the Irish Civil War. It's a small little volume, An Introduction to the Irish Civil War by John O'Donovan. Um, Mercier Books, very tiny. Um, but it offers a fresh perspective on the causes, development, and consequences of the Civil War triggered by the signing of the Anglo Treaty. 
as it accepted less than complete independence. Very few of the active IRA commanders in the field supported the treaty, and as is so often the case in civil wars, controversy over the conduct of both sides figures heavily. Events in late 1922 and early 1923 created a legacy of bitterness and poisoned relations between Republicans and free staters for several generations because of waves of dishonorable killings. The most enduring of these controversies surrounded a police sum uh, uh, sorry, surrounded a policy of summary executions carried out by the provisional government from November 1922. At local level, the conduct of both sides left bitter legacies. This book offers an overview of the war in all regions of Ireland. So this would be a good primer for me. Um, it's got some nice uh, just pictures some throughout, but yes, yeah, so a small little intro just to kind of wet your whistle, get you familiar with some of the terms and groups and stuff, and then you can move on to some deeper reading on the topic. Um, and then I think, do I have another one of Irishness? <laughs> Irishness, that's funny. Um, don't think so. Let's move on to this one. This is a pen and sword military uh, title. Um, it's a diary. So I'm looking forward to that. This is Captured at Singapore, a diary of a Far East prisoner of war. Uh, it's by Jill, by Jill Robertson and Jan Slimming, forward by Terry Waite. Nice sturdy book here. Um, let's see. Mm, cultivated from a small faded address book secretly written by a young soldier in the Royal Army Service Corps, captured at Singapore is a POW story of adventure, courage, resilience, and luck. In 1940, Londoner Stanley Moore became driver and tr uh, that was like a, a number and trained for desert warfare along with many others in the British Army's 18th, Divi 18th Division. Their mission, they thought, was to fight against Hitler and fascism in the Middle East. But in a change of plan and destination, he and his fellow servicemen became sacrificial lambs on a continent much further from home. After tough, rudimentary combat training in England, Stan's division set off on a secret overseas mission. After months at sea and several unexpected ports of call, their convoy was redirected to the other side of the world as the Imperial Japanese Army rampaged across Manchuria, Hong Kong, and other parts of Asia. Singapore was under sole British jurisdiction, and a large naval base had been built after the First World War to defend the island at the foot of the Malay pen Peninsula. The British government believed Japan would never attack their prized territory and so left Singapore to fight for itself with limited troops and outdated equipment. But after an attack on Pearl Harbor, the undertrained and undersupplied 18th Division was redirected to fight the Japanese. Using extensive research and personal documents, the author's account via their father's small faded diary and his 1990 tape recording, tells of Stan's journey and arrival in Keppel Harbor under shellfire. The horrific 17-day battle to defend the island, the Japanese admonition, and the harrowing forced labor conditions after capitulation. Only a small percentage of the 85,000 British troops returned after the war. Captivity and years of trauma ultimately stole years of the young soldiers' lives which they were later ordered to forget by the British government. The aim of this work is to provide information for future generations to understand how ordinary men died under horrific conditions of war and how the lucky survived. Wow, it's gonna be pretty powerful. So this is written by children. Um, daughter and son or daughter and two daughters, I don't know. Um, of of this gentleman here, Stan Stanley Moore, captured at Singapore. So that sounds very good. Ooh, and I love a good a book like this. It's uh, got all the elements of espionage and yeah, thriller action and hunting down bad guys. This is capturing Eichmann, An another memoir, right? The memoir of a Mossad spymaster, uh, by Rafi. Itan, introduced by Anshel Pfeffer and translated by Galena Roman. So, right up my alley. Oh, this is Green Hill Books. My good friend Michael at Green Hill Books, featuring <laughs> capturing Eichmann. Um, Green Hill Books is putting out some great books. I just recently reviewed Screams of the Drowning uh, that ran in the Saber and Scroll Journal. 
Um, it'll be pr it'd be printed for the uh, winter, sorry, for the summer edition. Um, but it's already up on the website, so you can read that. Let me know if you're interested. Um, or check my social. I always put up pictures of the books I've reviewed, and you can find a link. Um, Argentina, 1960. A car speeds through the streets of Buenos Aires. Inside are four Israeli secret agents and their prisoner, one of the most notorious war criminals of Nazi Germany. The Mossad operative's aim is to get this man, Adolf Eichmann, back to Israel to be tried for his role in the Holocaust. Holding Eichmann's head down out of sight is the leader of this ambitious, ambitious mission, Rafi Aitan. In this highly personal and detailed memoir, Rafi Aitan tells the story of his remarkable life and career as an elite soldier and spymaster. He describes how, as a teenager, he smuggled Jewish refugees into Palestine and then went on to fight in Israel's War of Independence. Aitan then transferred to the secret world, beginning a long career in both the security service, Shin Bet, and the intelligence service, Mossad. After the Eichmann operation and many others, Aitan's secret career eventually ended with his involvement in the controversial Jonathan Pollard espionage affair, which sparked intense debate over Israel's relations with the USA. Packed with new insights into Aitan's role at the heart of Israeli military and intelligence organizations, this is a gripping tale and essential reading for anyone interested in espionage history right here, um, and especially the daring operation to capture Adolf Eichmann, which was, you know, that makes for good reading right there. Oh. Lots of wonderful photos. So, we are replete with wonderful memoirs in this hall. We've got a lot of memoirs along with some great history, so I'm really excited. Um, it's just the variety, diversity of uh, perspectives. Um, okay, down the last few books here. So, you know, this is a... This book refers to a piece of uh, contemporary fiction or literature that I have not read yet, and you think that I would have, but I think that I might need to read it sooner rather than later. Um, but this is referring to Catch-22, Joseph Heller's classic book, right? Well, this book is called The True Story of Catch-22, The Real Men and Missions of Joseph Heller's 340th Bomb Group in World War II by Patricia Chapman Mader. This is a casemate title. Um... So it says here, after the publication of uh, his best-selling novel, Catch-22, Joseph Heller usually chose to den deny that any of his richly drawn characters were based on his actual war mates. However, to those who served with Heller in the 340th Bomb Group, the novel's characters were indeed recognizable. We finally encounter the real men and combat missions on which the novel was based. While Heller's fully developed characters stand solely, solidly, and uniquely on their own merits, the true story of Catch-22 proves that any resemblance to persons living or dead is, in fact, actual. This three-part book blends fact, fancy, and history with full-blown original illustrations and rare, previously unpublished photos of these daring U.S. Army Air Force flyers and their Corsican-based B-25 Mitchell, along with descriptions of the 340th real-time war events, work includes 12 men of the bomb group relating 12 richly told tales of their own. Um, this is, this is f fantastic. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, looking forward to that. This is richly, uh, got some interesting inserts here. Mm. Oh, this is good stuff, huh? Meet the heroes. Um, we got some interviews in there. Fabulous. I'm really excited for this title. And I need to read the book. <laughs> uh, two very, the, the last th three or four books are very recent arrivals here at the History Shelf. Uh, they've arrived in the last week or so. Um, this one here is a, it's brand new. It's out by Casemates, small little paperback. This is called Eastern Inferno, the journals of a German Panzerjäger on the Eastern Front, 1941 to 1943 edited by Christine Alexander and Mason Coons. This is a casemate title. Let's see here. So yeah, these are brand new. I wasn't even aware of these. Thanks. Thank you for sending. 
case made. Thank you, Daniel. This book presents the intimate and detailed personal journals of a German soldier who fought in Operation Barbarossa and subsequent bloody battles on the Eastern Front. Hans Roth was a member of the anti-tank, also that's in German, it's called Panzer, Panzerjäger. Um, he was a member of the anti-tank battalion, 299th Infantry Division, attached to the 6th Army. Writing as events transpired, he recorded his fears, his thoughts about his orders and the fighting, uh, battles against the fabled Russian winter, uh, his longing for his family, his fighting unit's camaraderie, and interactions with civilians. Roth was officially declared lost in the war in 1950, and his three journals were discovered many years after his disappearance. His legacy is an incredible kinescope um, in words of the German attack on the USSR during World War II. Oh, wow. And the authors here are Hans Roth is Hans Roth's grandchildren, and they provide the translation and background information of, of these journals and made this book possible. Very, very wonderful. Wow, okay. And he never came back. That's, that's sad, but his journals were found. That's something else. Um, so, yeah, um, put me down for this. This sounds great. Another uh, similar size book. I don't know if this might be a new type of uh, release that Casemate is doing. They're both kind of like the same size. So we had Eastern Inferno. Now we have Days of Valor, an inside account of the bloodiest six months of the Vietnam War by Robert L. Tonsetic. Um, Casemate title. Um, yeah, I like these smaller little paperbacks. These are great. So what do we have here with Days of Valor? I have a sheet I can read from here. The 199th Light Infantry Brigade was created from three U.S. infantry battalions of long lineage as a fast reaction force to place in Vietnam. As the book begins in December 1967, the brigade has been at war for a year and many of its battered 12-month men are returning home. The communists seem to be in a lull and the brigade commander requests a transfer to a more active sector just above Saigon. Through January, the battalion sense increasing enemy strength. NVA personnel now mixed with Viet Cong units, but the enemy is lying low, and a truce, a truce has even been declared for the Vietnamese New Year, the holiday called Tet. On January 30th, 1968, all hell breaks loose, as Saigon and nearly every provincial capital was overrun by VC and, and, and NVA, bursting in unexpected strength from their base camps. In this book, we learn the most intimate details of combat as the communists fight with rockets, mortars, Chinese claymores, mines, machine guns, and AK-47s. The battles evolve into an enemy favoring the cloak of night, the jungle, both ur urban and natural, and subterranean fortifications against U.S. forces favoring direct confrontational battles supported by air and artillery. When the lines are only 25 yards apart, however, there is little way to, s to distinguish between the firepower or courage of the assailants and the defenders, or even who is who at any given moment, as both sides have the other in direct sight. Wow. So this sounds really great. It's going to be an, an epic kind of battle piece um, study here. Well, I'm glad I've got some bifocals, because the print on these books is very small. <laughs> to me, that's very small. <laughs> Um, so those are two, uh, two paperback releases, um, from Casemate, and let's see here. And the final two books, oh boy, these are, <laughs> it, it's really cool for a reference. This is another type of book for like coffee table or something you'd pull out just to kind of show for pictures, <sighs> like a, you know, if you like a virtual trip to the museum. Um, this is a two-volume set, and it's for it's collector's guide. So I was intrigued to just to take a look at this. I, I wasn't even aware of these two, and the casemate sent them to me. So thank you so much. We have <laughs> the GI Collector's Guide, Volume One. This is for U.S. Army Service Forces Catalog, European Theater of Operations. Henry, Paul, and James. And James. So there's the first volume. Look at this. And then volume two, same U.S. Army Service Forces Catalog European Theater of Operations. So volumes one and two. 
and uh, the first volume, I'm telling you, it's just rich and like shows you all the different type of, uh, oh, insignia, decorations, medals. Um, uh, so that's really cool. It is a treasure trove. I mean, it even goes down to the buttons, the clutch fasteners. Um, but as you get in further, just even shows the kit that they these guys had for the different like airborne troops. Um, bivouac equipment. What? I mean, this has got everything. Weapons, uh, canisters, frags. Clothing. Look at the underwear. You got underwear. <laughs> what? So it's like going to a, a, a museum. I mean, you don't even have to leave your house. Um, so, yeah, U.S. mail bags, some types of stationery that people use. So how neat is that? So it's a collector's guide, you, and, but I think it's interesting even if you're not a collector. And then um, Volume 2 has really interesting things like... Um, I was interested in like the soda bottles and things like that too. Oh, life on the post. Look at these old versions of like, you know, shaving powder and um, razor blades. More stuff on weapons. Individual equipment, uniforms. Oh, here we go. Here's some sodas. <laughs> Army rations. Female personnel, what they wore. I mean, is this not cool? Uh, so if you're a collector and or you love looking at just memorabilia from World War II, check out Volume 1 and 2 from Casemate of the GI Collector's Guide. So what a fantastic reference, and uh, I'm just so thrilled I can share that with you guys. Um, so that's it for now. Um, I Casemate is just one of my best friends, and uh, I love I love their histories. I, I go, I, you know, they're constantly on my night, night table reading, you know, so, and they just keep me in clover. I've just got so many great reads here. So please visit Casemate, check out their stuff. Um, let me know what you think about these books. Um, I'll have more. I, I like to save up a whole bunch for a nice long 40 minute video. And uh, there's always more Casemate coming in. So until next time, booktube, enjoy. Let me know what you think and uh, keep reading and Stay well, stay healthy, and we'll talk next time. Bye.